I'm going to talk a bit about uh, taking some of these models that you've already heard about in the summer school and introducing uh, structure in them to be able to model temporal dependencies. The first half of this, this my part of the tutorial is going to be on sequences. So uh, just for an overview of, of what I'll be talking about today, the first uh, thing we're going to talk about is basically learning these representations of temporal data. And I'm going to start with kind of an introductory part that covers some of the existing models uh, people have used for modeling sequences. And then we're going to move into some newer uh, approaches that have been inspired by some of these ideas in, in deep learning and representation learning. So you'll probably see a lot of connections to what you've already heard about, um, but the idea here is that we're going to be modeling data that has temporal dependencies. I'm also going to focus on some applications, and um, in particular, I'm going to focus on modeling human pose and activity, because that's something I'm interested in. Um, so we'll talk about modeling uh, very highly structured data like motion capture, and we'll also talk about modeling uh, weakly structured data, uh, which is, is more challenging, um, so things like video. So a lot of the ideas, while well, I'll be focusing on these type of human pose and activity applications, these ideas are generally applicable to, to uh, other, other areas. Okay, so the outline of uh, this part of the, the tutorial is going to be as follows. So we're going to talk about um, basically the modeling aspects. Um, we're going to introduce these models are called composable distributed state models, and this is uh, what I worked on in my PhD thesis. So we'll talk about extensions of restricted Boltzmann machines that can model time series. And then, um, if you know, depending on how many questions there are and, and how things go, we may talk about um, doing video analysis at the end, and, and specifically doing activity recognition. Okay, so let's get started with time series data. So you'll find that time is really integral in a lot of human behaviors. So things like uh, human motion, what I'm interested in, um, human reasoning, uh, time is a big part of that. So a lot of the time, uh, people just ignore the temporal aspects and treat data as IID. And this often will pose some, some challenges and problems. And, and other times, people will, will try to model time series, but these models will fail to account for uh, certain challenges in the data. So data could be high dimensional, non-linear, you know, have these long range dependencies. And these are, the time, these are the type of things that we'd like to address with our models. So this is specifically what we're going to be talking about today is addressing these, these types of time series challenges with feature learning and deep learning methods. So the most uh, simple approach we could possibly use to model time series is something called a vector autoregressive model. You've, uh, you know some statistics, you've probably heard about it before because it's been around for probably more than 50 years. And uh, it's really dominated the statistical literature on time series. So basically the idea here is that you have some, some observations. I'm going to call observations V, meaning that they're visible. And the observations are modeled as uh, a linear combination of past uh, instances of those observations, right? So you look at a fixed window of the past, and you make a linear prediction on what the current observation or future observation should be. And then there's a noise term E. And because of the simple structure of this model, it can actually be fit very easily by least squares uh, regression. And um, so that's the good thing about this model. The bad thing is that it can fail for very simple nonlinearities present in, in, the, in the data. So for things like human motion, uh, these type of models are, are not very good in, in, in sort of capturing the, the intricate nonlinear dependencies in the motion. And uh, there's also some stability issues with training them. They tend to, to shrink or, or, uh, or blow up unless, unless you're able to control these models. So they are well understood, and there's many extensions to autoaggressive models. Uh, things like having uh, covariant structure that changes over time and so forth. The discrete analog to uh, vector autoaggressive models, I should say that usually these, these vector autoaggressive models are used for modeling uh, real valued data. Um, and it has a type of Gaussian assumption on it. Now, if we want to model discrete data, like, say, words um, or characters, we can use something called a Markov model, or uh, known in the, the NLP and, um, and, and, and linguistics literature as uh, n-gram models. So n refers to the number of fixed time steps in the past that you consider when making a prediction. 
Okay, so there's, again, I'm, I'm calling this fully observable because there's no notion of hidden state. Uh, we just have observations and we're going to use past observations to predict future observations. So these models are derived by something called the Markov property and I'm sure many of you have heard about this before. So um, basically the idea here is that you know, the, the conditional probability of the, the next uh, observation given the whole history of previous observations can be just essentially truncated. We say don't worry about all this stuff way back in the past and just worry about an end step window of the past and assume that you know, this is all, all we need to know to, to model. So we maintain some connections to the past and this leads to a very simple form of joint distribution. So for all the observations in the sequence you basically have uh, this nice decoupling of these uh, end step terms. Now, the problem with these models is they lead to sort of a, a parameter explosion. Um, the parameters are exponential in n, so to some people this is totally obvious, um, but I have a little picture here just to demonstrate that. So if we are modeling, say, an alphabet of three characters, you know, A, B, or C, the, the parameters of this Markov model are completely specified by this three by three conditional probability distribution, right? What's the probability of, of seeing, say, an, an A given that I just saw a B? So this is a first order Markov model because we only care about the last observation. If we now extend this to a second order Markov model, now uh, we have 27 uh, parameters and we have to maintain sort of conditioning on, on a two-step history. So if you, can, if you keep extending this, your number of parameters blow up very quickly. And this is basically tells you if you have an alphabet size of Q, then basically this is the size of your parameter space. So we can go another step further and talk about these things called hidden Markov models. So this is where we start introducing latent state or hidden variables. And you'll see that, um, so I'm going to always call hidden variables H in my talk. And we're going to have this hidden state sort of control the dependence of these observations on the past. So you see they're no longer linked directly to each other, but they have this hidden state that sort of propagates uh, the dynamic information, right? And once we come up with a hidden state sequence, again through some arbitrary nonlinear uh, conditional probability distributions, we can then have this other model called the observation model, which generates uh, observations from the hidden state. And these models have been very successful in speech and um, language model, and they've also been quite successful in biology as well. And they're completely defined by three sets of parameters. So we have um, what's called the initial state prior. So this pi, this basically gives a prior over which hidden state we start up in. And then we also have the transition matrix. So this defines the probability of transitioning into a new hidden state given the past hidden state. And then finally, we have this emission distribution. And that maps the hidden state to the observations. Okay, so again, like the standard Markov models, this factors into a very a nice form of joint distribution where you can get a, a joint probability over a sequence of hidden states and observations. And um, basically, I'll show you why these models are, are quite nice, and then we'll talk about what's not so nice about them. So typically, there are three things we'd like to perform in HMMs. So the first thing we'd like to perform is something called likelihood estimation. So this is given a sequence of observations, V1 to V uh, capital T. We'd like to compute the likelihood of observing that sequence under our model. This involves integrating out the hidden states, and this produces uh, you know, a probability of, of observing that sequence. And this is easily done in an HMM. It's um, using uh, basically relying on the, what we're next going to talk about is inference, but basically uh, this, this kind of integration relies on some basically dynamic programming tricks and um, we can easily compute these likelihoods. The other thing we'd like to do is inference. So given the setting of the vis visible variables, either come up with a distribution over hidden states um, and this relies on something called the forward-backward algorithm, again making use of dynamic programming tricks. Um, or come up with the most likely state sequence, given that sequence of observations, right? And this uses something called the, the Viterbi algorithm. So these are all well understood. Um, and also learning in, this in these models are very simple too. So learning is basically estimating the values of these, these red links, so the observation model and the transition matrix, and, and the prior over the first state. So these things are all nice and easy to do in HMM. So 
Um, what's the catch? Well, many high dimensional data sets that we're interested in contain what's called rich componential structure. Um, we can use componential, we can also talk about dis distributed representations or distributed structure. And this is the idea that observations or, or things we notice in the world don't come from just one of k prototypes. There's op often a number of factors that are very complex and they, and they, they, they cooperate, integrate to create things. Um, so when we're talking about generative models, it would be nice to talk about a series of, of complicated factors that interact and generate observations instead of just every observation coming from a single one of k uh, thing. So these HMMs, they can't really model this type of complicated data very effectively because they rely on this, this k state, uh, one of k states. So basically to model k bits of information, they're, they're going to need an exponential number of states. So here's a little picture of what I mean by this. Um, you have some observations. Maybe there's, there's two things that look completely different. And uh, let's, let's not worry about time series for now. Let's just think about static observations and having a state like an HMM does to generate these observations. But these guys may be generated just by flipping one of these bits on. So you know, to generate a car, we, we turn on this state. To generate a little animal, we turn on this state. But this isn't a really efficient way to, to generate um, images or, or these objects. So especially if I look at this, now we have a, a car and another car and it has a different rotation, maybe the lighting's a little bit different, maybe the elevation's a little bit different and so forth. It's really a number of interacting factors that, that generate these things. So it, makes, it, it doesn't really make sense to represent them by prototypes. So what we really want is um, this distributed hidden state or componential hidden state and th these are more representationally powerful uh, latent state representations. So these are the types of time series models we'd like to uh, derive. So there's another type of model that you've, uh, many of you have heard about, which is called a linear dynamical system. And it just turns out that this type of model has the exact same type of graphical model as an HMM. So basically the same structure, but now our hidden states are continuous, or real, real valued vectors. And this means that they're a lot more powerful for representing data, um, but there are some limitations with this model. So mainly, to be able to have uh, these more representationally powerful latent states, which are actually continuous, and to still be able to do tractable inference and learning in this model, we have to put some assumptions here. So we assume linear Gaussian, Gaussian dynamics, you know, so basically how we go from one hidden state to another, and we also assume linear Gaussian mapping from hidden state space to observations. So going from the hidden states to these visible uh, variables, we basically have um, Gaussian relationships on both of them. So we have a linear mapping to set the mean, we maintain some covariance structure, uh, so this is to come up with the next hidden state, and same with going from a hidden state to visible. Again, we just basically take a matrix, multiply it by the, the real valued hidden state, and have some uh, covariance we're maintaining, and basically have a, a normal defined on that guy. So basically, again, we can do inference and learning in these models tractably, efficiently, um, but they can't model things like human motion very well. Okay, so we know now that data for these, many of these real world problems is, is, is complex and high dimensional, it's nonlinear, and so you know, HMMs on one hand give us a complex nonlinear emission model, but the downside of these, these models is that it just has a simple one of k state, right? And linear dynamical systems has a state that can convey much more information, but the emission model and the, observe, uh, the, emission model and the dynamics are linear. Okay, so we'd like to come up with something that sort of gets the best of both of these algorithms or these both, both of these models. And um, so we're going to talk about learning distributed representations. So you've already seen that a lot of simple networks, you know, things like uh, multilayer perceptrons, um, autoencoders, deep belief nets, and so forth, are able to in discover very interesting representations of static data. So we'd like to ask, can we learn in a similar way representations of temporal data? So perhaps the easiest thing we could do is just take you know, some time series. So here we just have maybe some, some uh, audio data, which is represented by a spectrogram. And we have, over time, um, some, some power in different frequencies. And basically, we're going to just take a window of this and flatten it 
to a vector, right? And then just apply this vector to our standard neural net, for example. Um, but there's a few reasons why this isn't really a great thing to do. So um, this is probably the only time you're going to hear me talk about things being biologically plausible, but really maintaining a buffer uh, like this is not, not really biological, biologically plausible. And depending on who you talk to, some people care more or less about how biologically plausible algorithms are. And so the other thing is that these, this, this type of mechanism can't really process inputs of differing length. So you've heard about things like convolutional nets for, for static data, and those can process uh, images of differing size. So we can use tricks like that to be able to process inputs of differing length, but not if we use fixed length vectors like this. So the other thing that's not so good about using this spatial representation of time is that we can't really distinguish between absolute and relative position in time series. So what we'd like to do really is motivate an implicit representation of time. So the, the notion of time is going to be represented by its effect on processing or the, the type of structure of our model um, and not basically which element of the vector corresponds to uh, which frame number, right? So let's um, quickly talk about sort of a, a history of these methods. So really, I don't have time to really go into depth on any of these methods, but I just want to say that these, these ideas have been kicking around for a long time. So things like Elman networks go back to the early uh, 90s, even in, in Mike Jordan was working on these models in the, in, in the 80s. Um, so these use sort of time delayed context units um, to introduce temporal dependencies into sort of standard neural nets. We have a very early ex extension of uh, Bolton machines through time. So this is proposed by Chris Williams and Jeff Hinton back in 1990 at a, at a summer school, uh, actually. And um, we have things like spiking Bolton machines. So this work by Hinton and Brown was pretty much the first use of RBMs to be modeling static data. So th this is roughly to give you some pointers if you're interested in the development of uh, some of these temporal extensions to, to neural nets. Um, but what I will focus on, and this is probably going to be the only overlap of this talk with, with Jeff Hinton's talk, um, is, is the recurrent neural network. And I, I do this because I think it's a very interesting and powerful model. And so um, basically the idea behind a recurrent neural net is you're replicating standard feedforward networks in time. Right? So basically at each time, time frame you have an MLP. And the thing that differs from a standard MLP is that you're going to introduce these connections between the hidden units at different time frames. And this is going to introduce some, some rich temporal dependencies. So let's just quickly go through how we actually process inputs in an RNN. Um, we have at any time frame a visible vector arriving at the inputs. We're going to uh, act on it by this uh, weight matrix here. And then what differs here from a standard MLP is that we're going to have another weight, weight matrix which can, processes our previous instantiation of the hiddens. And that makes a, a, an additive contribution. And then there's a standard bias, right? So you get some uh, input to the hidden units. And then we just use a standard nonlinear uh, element-wise activation like you would in a standard neural net like TANH or, or sigmoid or whatever. And then once you have your activation of the hidden state, which has you know, connections from the input and connections from the past, you're going to process it by another set of weights, which is going to produce an output. And, and gen generally, your output will have some other type of nonlinearity, which is chosen to give you the types of outputs that will match your data. So you might want to make binary predictions. So you might have a sigmoid there at the output, or you might want to have a softmax to represent categorical information, or you might want to have just real valued units where you don't have a nonlinear activation at all. And so basically, you can make these predictions at each time step, and you can use backpropagation through time to train this. So um, in theory, these are extremely powerful models because of this sort of high, high dimensional a distributed internal representation that propagates from one time frame to the next. And the exact gradient, gradients, as I already said, can be computed through BPTT. So um, what's the catch? It sounds, it sounds great. Well, the problem is that training these models via gradient descent typically fails on even very simple problems. Okay, And this is attributed to this idea of vanishing or exploding gradients you've heard about already, because this affects not just recurrent neural nets, but standard deep networks with many, many layers as well. The problem is with the recurrent neural net, if you want to capture long-term temporal dependencies, 
You think of a recurrent neural net as just taking basically like a standard neural net and flipping on its side, right? So if you're trying to model dependencies 100 or 1,000 connections back in time, it's like having a 1,000 layer neural net, right? So these vanishing gradient problems really creep up here. And basically, this is the idea that the sort of exact type of weight structure that you need to maintain stability in terms of this trading are, is, is just sort of uh, enough to make these gradients shrink. You're doing successive weight multiplications by things that just keep on growing smaller and smaller and smaller. So a lot of work went in, in the 1990s that focused on identifying some of the problems with training RNNs. Um, Unfortunately, you know, there were some techniques proposed, but nothing really caught on. Probably the, um, the best known attempts that do kind of have a niche following, something called the long short-term memory. So there's a bunch of uh, students from uh, Jürgen Schmidt Huber's lab uh, in, in Switzerland, and they know how to train these things, and they're quite powerful models. Um, and then there's also interest, again, um, I would say more Euro European interest in, in echo state networks. So this is the idea of using um, sort of a static initialization of, of the network dynamics, uh, getting it to a stable state, and then just training outputs on top of this fixed dynamical reservoir. So, I mean, these, these are very interesting models, but they, I would argue that they haven't really gained uh, mainstream acceptance. And so, let's talk about very, very briefly why gradient descent doesn't work very well for deep neural networks, and, and in particular, RNN. So we all know about uh, the problems associated with local minima, and that's something we kind of just um, you know, acknowledge it's there and, and, and get on with our, our, our lives. The, the thing that we can really um, address, and, and what James Martins and Ilias Suskever have looked at, in particular in the last couple of years, is something called pathological curvature. And this is something that Jeff hinted at in his third tutorial. So this is the Rosenbrock function. You may have seen it before. It's just a, a, a function in, in, in uh, two dimensions that exhibits this, this idea of pathological curvature. So what this means is that there's directions of high reduction of the, of the function you're trying to reduce, and, and they have high curvature as well. So basically, gradient descent follows these very steep directions to reduce the objective, and it ends up bouncing around, right? Whereas there are these directions of very low uh, objective reduction and, and low curvature in which if you just follow these directions for a very long time, you'll get down to a, a better solution. So gradient descent won't help us find these directions of low reduction curvature. And that's what second order methods can help us do. So basically second order methods model the objective function by using a, a, a local approximation, uh, second order approximation. And um, they use basically a, a matrix to quantify this curvature. And in uh, Newton's method, which you may have heard about, um, you use the exact Hessian or a damped form of the Hessian to quantify the curvature. And you're basically trying to, um, you can solve analytically for this, this direction P that's going to um, basically not just follow the direction of the steepest descent, but take this curvature information to a, into account to find you more sensible directions to follow. The problem is that for high dimensional problems like neural nets, so we're talking about dimensions in the number of parameters. So neural nets have a lot of parameters, maybe millions of parameters, and to form the Hessian when you have a million parameters is not really feasible. So what James Martins and Ilya Sitzkever came up with were, was a variant of something called Hessian free optimization that had actually been kicking around for a long time. But they, they have a couple of, of ideas on how to, sort of, I would say, some more principal ideas. And there's also kind of some tricks uh, that you need to do to make it work with neural nets. So they were able to get it working on standard uh, deep neural networks, and then they said, oh, well, why don't we just apply this to recurrent neural networks as well? So the, basically the two main observations they made was that the Hessian vector product, you know, HD for some vector D, can be computed very efficiently using numerical methods. And so either finite differences or what they use in practice is something called the R operator. And so if you can compute this efficiently, what does that give you? Well, if you have a quadratic ap approximation um, to your objective, like we were just looking at in these second order methods, then um, there's one in particular that you've all heard about called linear conjugate gradient that requires only Hessian vector products to, to operate. 
And so this, I should point out, is, is just true conjugate gradient, linear conjugate gradient. Uh, this is, you may have heard several times people kicking around the term conjugate gradient. Usually they're talking about nonlinear conjugate gradient. But this is just using regular conjugate gradient. And this, this uh, trick to, to efficiently compute uh, Hessian vector products. And basically what they were able to show is that they could solve these problems that people in the 90s had previously been able to solve. So this is just very simple things like memorizing something over 100 time steps or, or 200 time steps. This couldn't be done before with standard gradient descent in, in recurrent neural networks. So um, I should point out to Jeff mentioned as well that um, Ilya has a new way of, of looking at this. And this is actually initializing the weights of a current neural network, the dynamics using an echo state network. And he claims that you might not even need Hessian free at all. But um, I do have some code online, James already pointed out. If you're interested in, in playing around with recurrent neural networks, and in particular using this Hessian free approach, um, you may want to check, check that out. If you find problems with it, you can submit um, issues on, on GitHub. And this makes use of uh, a student from University of Montreal, his very nice implementation of, of Hessian free. OK, so. I've told you all the good things about recurrent networks, recurrent neural networks, and the fact that they can now be trained um, properly and efficiently. But what's, what's good and what's bad about them? Well, there are certain times when you would like to use RNNs. If you're interested in making univariate predictions um, at each time step, recurrent neural nets are very good. Um, but many sequences have very high dimensional and complex structure. We've been talking about this a lot. And these are things like music. So you might have, I don't know, 100 some odd notes and you want to generate chords. And there's very rich dependencies between the notes and those chords. Or you might be modeling, again, human motion, which has about 60 to 100 joint angles. And those joint angles also have very rich dependencies. RNNs are not really good at predicting these types of structured observations. Um, they basically can't capture the multimodality because if you're modeling re real valued things in the neural network, all you basically get is an element-wise mean. And so when Jeff talked about this, this character model and sampling from it, he had a single softmax unit which represented the next character produced by that model. So that's why if you want to produce a single thing and have a, a distribution, a univariate distribution over a single item, recurrent neural networks are fine. But once you want to get more complex multimodal data, we want to maybe talk about generative models and things like RBMs. So can we use RBMs in a temporal way? So this would allow us to achieve the nonlinear dynamics and this nonlinear observation model in the HMM without the very limited hidden state. And the efficient expressive state of the linear dynamical system without the linear Gaussian assumptions. OK, so you're going to get the best worlds of the HMM and the LDS. So let's, let's turn back now to, to RBMs. OK, so usually um, using distributed binary representations in, in time series models makes inference different, difficult. And you've heard Jeff talk about this. Um, and he's, he's, he's told you already that if you use an RBM, you can do efficient exact inference. So um, how do we turn this into a time series model? Well, we can use a, a, a trick called conditioning. And we treat the visible variables in the previous time slice as additional fixed inputs. And the nice thing about this is it doesn't really change inference or learning in the model. So basically, the idea is take an RBM. And you know, let's say we're going to represent a, a, a time series like human motion. This might produce something like 60 joint angles. And we're going to feed those guys into the visible units of an RBM and model them. Um, and then what we want to do is associate with each of these uh, visible observations a series of binary units. Right? So we're going to have a, a Gaussian to binary RBM. And we're going to modify it to connect to the past. All right? So this is your standard RBM, series of visible units, series of hidden units. But I'm going to have copies of the past and connect those to the visible layer. So this type of connection is something you've already seen in this talk, and that's the autoregressive model. So you have a linear prediction for your visibles 
given the you know, short window of the past. In, in, in human motion, model, motion modeling, we use maybe six or 12 time steps in the past. But we're also going to connect the past to the hidden layer as well. So when we do inference, we have this extra term coming in that gives us information from the past. And this conditioning in this way does not change inference, nor does it change learning. Okay? You can just use contrastive divergence. Usually people ask the question at this point, which is, why don't we have links between the hidden units? Well, you could have the hidden connected to past copies of the hidden as well. This makes inference much more difficult unless you use approximate methods. So this is something I'm not going to get into in this tutorial because things get more complicated. But there has been work on more complicated models that um, propagate information in time through the hidden units, much like a recurrent neural network. And if you want to learn more about that, we can, we can talk about that after. Okay, so how does contrastive divergence... Oh, question here. So on the last slide... Yes. Um, is this, how is this different than uh, having a time window? For example, because uh, you're picking some arbitrary number of steps, to visible steps back. Yes, yeah, so you do, you, you, you are picking some arbitrary time window on which to condition the model, um, but you're, you're having it interact basically through the hidden units and also through the visible units. You're not just taking a, a, a time window and applying it as, as an observation. So you're actually kind of changing the structure of the model to reflect the temporal structure. It's, it's kind of a subtle change but it's not the same as just taking a fixed time window and applying it to a static RBM. So basically you have, when you're doing inference in this model, you have an extra term coming through a separate set of weights here. And you have a, when you're doing reconstruction, you have another uh, extra term that influences the reconstruction. Okay, so this is a conditional restricted Boltzmann machine, and we can train it with contrast contrasted divergence. So how we do this is, you have hopefully remember back to the, the earlier slides on contrasted divergence. It's exactly the same, but as I said, when we do inference, we have some extra inputs coming in from the past. And you can treat these as kind of like a dynamically changing bias. That's the way you can view them. And then when we go down to reconstruct, we also have these connections coming in from the past. And then again, you go up and do inference again, you have this connection from the past and so forth. So we can still measure these correlations that we need between visibles and hiddens um, and, and, and update our weights. Now, we also need to, for updating these autoregressive weights, we need to model correlations or measure correlations between the past and, and current visibles and also the past and the, the hiddens to update these green connections as well. So there, there are details about that and you, you can read about that in, in, in the papers. Another cool thing about this type of model is you can actually stack it. And we find that stacking this model actually gives us sort of qual qualitatively um, better motion when being generated by this model. I'll show you some motion in a second. Um, but basically the idea here is like in a static RBM, we can train it up with some data, um, apply the data, get some hidden unit activations out, and then treat these hidden units as sort of new fixed uh, sort of observable data and basically add another conditional restricted Boltzmann machine on top of this. Okay, so you get something that's a conditional deep belief network. And you can basically sample data from the entire model. Um, okay, so let's look at some motion being synthesized from such a model. So I'll get it going. This is uh, data from uh, Carnegie Mellon's motion capture database. And this model has been trained on about 8,000 frames of data at 60 frames per second. And they've had a grad student walk like a chicken um, or a dinosaur. Um, and basically, we initialize the model with six frames of a particular style and ask it to continue on generating. Um, I think this is the dinosaur one that you're seeing here. Um, so autoregressive models would not be able to do this. Um, it's, it's, this is drunk, which is, uh, you can maybe think that looks a little bit drunk. Um, but yeah, it can do very complicated movements, just initialized with six frames of motion and propagate forward. And this thing takes about an hour to train on a modern workstation. And this is a two layer model with a, a 600 binary hidden units per layer. Okay. So, 
this is really cool. You can initialize it with a particular style, and it can continue on generally uh, generating all these different styles. This is a single model generating 10 different styles of motion. But the problem sometimes is that it will suddenly switch into a different style. You also can only really control the style through initializing. So you can't really force it to, to stay in a particular style or transition from one style to another style. And so what we were interested in doing was looking at a way of integrating the style information into the model because we had this context available in the form of labels. We knew you know, whether it was dinosaur or chicken motion or cat motion or whatever. This is old man, which actually ended up being the toughest motion to model. Um, so to get the style information into model, I'm going to have to take a little bit of a diversion. Um, this is basically the standard way of in incorporating labels into deep belief networks. So you stick some label units at the top. Jeff showed you a static model where you had some digit labels. And this changed the energy landscape in the model. And by flipping these labels, you're able to generate different digits through, through Gibbs sampling. But when you provide, say, style or person labels in a conditional restricted Boltz machine, there's a little bit of a problem. So let's, let's take a look at why this might hurt us a little bit. So here's a standard deep belief network. And we can you know, add in, uh, uh, some label variables here and then do Gibbs sampling and generate observations. That's fine. That works. But when we have a conditional deep belief network, we have all these extra condi conditioning connections that, in, that help us generate the dynamics, right? And inter introduce these rich um, temporal correlations and structure. So if we flip a label on here, this changes some biases to the top level hidden units. And this kind of gets propagated downward to the low, lower layer hidden units. But we still have all this other information coming in from sort of starting with the fixed past history that's influencing the dynamics, right? So this label is not really changing the dynamics in this model. So we'd like to do th two things. We'd like to introduce these style or context variables in a way that influences dynamics. And we'd also like to have an alternative to just introducing another bias. And that's the way that things are standard, that, that things are generally done, is just in, incorporating this new bias. So let's divert to something called multiplicative interactions, because that's how we're going to do this. So um, we're going to let these latent uh, variables act like gates. And the gates can dynamically change the connections between other variables. And what this amounts to is letting variables multiply connections between other variables. And we call these three-way multiplicative interactions. And these have been around for a long time, but they were kind of reintroduced to this community uh, by some work that Roland Mimicevic, who's speaking later in this tutorial, um, uh, he was doing some work in, in image modeling and, and video modeling. And he actually has a really good tutorial, I'm sure he's going to use parts of this tutorial in his talks. So you'll hear about it. But he also has a review paper on the subject of three-way interactions or multiplicative interactions. So I, I want to point that out. That's in my, my slides. Um, so you can go visit Roland's page on that. So he has two views of how this model works. Basically, um, you can look at it like an autoregressive model that has hidden units that change the weights in the autoregressive model, right? So that's the first model we talked about. It's basically you have observations from the past. They influence your, your future observations linearly. But now instead of having a fixed weight matrix, you have hidden units which blend in different weight matrices. So it's like a nonlinear version of autoregressive model. The other view you can take, this is the same model, but just a different way of looking at it, is a standard RBM with a set of extra input units that change the weights in the RBM, depending on the setting of the input units. And it's with this view that we can see that you can still do standard inference and, and contrastive divergence learning in this model, because for any setting of the input, that just defines an RBM. And all the math is still the same. And all the, the coding is essentially the same, too. OK, so Roland has this demonstration where he is modeling pairs of images. So we have, I, I know at the back it's difficult to see the bottom. So unfortunately, the labels are at the bottom. So I'll try to 
uh, explain each uh, column here. So rows are just different examples. So let's look at the first row. We have an input, we have an output. And we want to learn hidden variables that capture the transformation from input to output. These images don't really have any structure in them. It's only, the only structure is how they change. It's just pixels that translate up or down, or left or right or diagonally. And so the visualization of the, the, the hidden units that learn these transformations is seen here in the middle column. And you, these is basically a flow field that's going left to right. So this is just basically showing, given these input, this input and output, this induces some hidden representation. And then holding the input fixed, what does this latent representation tell the output to do? How does it tell it to move ink from the input to output? And what it tells it to do is to shift everything right. So it's learned to shift. Now you can take a totally new image it's never seen before, hold those hidden variables constant, and predict the output. And what it does is it takes a new image and it moves it right as well. And so in, in, in each of these cases, basically, it's learned to do these shifts. Now, shifts aren't that exciting, but it's a toy example that shows you um, basically what's being learned in this model and its transformations. So going back to motion style, instead of you letting these units represent transformations, let's let them represent context or style information. And um, we could ha also have it represent height or weight or gender or so forth but we're going to use it to represent the distinct or discrete styles in our motion. And learning and inference are going to remain exactly the same. Um, and we can just think of these style variables as sort of blending in new sub-networks, changing the parameters of our model each time we change the style variables. Okay, So we can do rich uh, parameter sharing, but have uh, sort of adapting dynamics in our model. OK, so here's our CRBM. I've just drawn it you know, with the standard autoaggressive connections, pass to hidden, and the standard RBM visible to hidden connections. What we're going to do is introduce a new set of variables. This variable is discrete. It represents the style, dinosaur, cat, chicken, whatever. Uh, we also have some features that, that sit between it. And these learn correlations between the styles. So this might learn something like chicken and cat or similar in some way. Um, and these are adapted automatically, and those are what basically interact or gate every other existing connection in the model. So they gate all three sets of connections. And so depending on the style, this changes the style features, and this changes the effective weights in the model. Okay? So um, there's still a problem. So if we do this, basically we have a parameter explosion. So we have now you know, we before, say, take these red weights, we used to have a, a, a matrix between hiddens and visibles, but now we have a tensor between these fe style features, uh, hidden variables, and visibles. And this also happens with every other set, the red and blue connections. We have 3D tensors now. So um, this is also assuming that basically the number of features, the number of visible units, the number of hidden units is, is the same. This kind of gives us this n cubed thing. If we want really overcomplete hiddens, the story is even worse because it's, it's more than n cubed. So fortunately, there's a, a simple and powerful solution to get around this problem, and that's called factoring. So Roland will also talk more on this subject um, in the second or third week. I forget when he's, when he's coming. But the idea here is that um, in many of these applications that require these multiplicative interactions, there's strong sort of underlying regularities in the data. And this means that you don't actually need this cubic number of parameters to, to represent your data. So things like um, in, in, in motion, you can't have completely arbitrary motion. It's, it's very constrained by what's in the data. So we should be able to reduce the number of our, our, our parameters by factoring. And essentially, we replace this tensor by three low rank matrices. And so now every individual value in that 3D tensor can be represented by an expression that depends on these three weight matrices. And this changes this n cubed parameterization into basically a 3n squared parameterization. All right? And we're going to, this is just a picture for the red connections, the hidden divisible, and then having the style features. But we will do this for all three sets of connections. So take our 
standard model again. We're going to introduce these features. We had these tensor relationships. Now we're going to factor them. And this has the effect of introducing these, these units, which we call the factors. They are linear units. They're not, they're not stochastic either. But they sort of sit between these matrices and pass things on to uh, the other units. OK, so this is the idea of factoring it. it basically, we go from n cubed to n squared parameterization. We can also go one step further and start tying parameters together. So if the, the red, the green, and the blue subwet networks um, each have the same number of factors, we could, these are basically these dots here represent parameter matrices. We have nine of them in this model now that we've introduced the factors. We can tie them all together. So anything connecting to the, connecting the style variables to these factors can share those weights. Anything connecting the hidden units to the factors can share weights, and so on. So basically, by parameter tying, now we only have four sets of, of parameter matrices. Okay? So let's look at the same data set, generate some motion, and see what we can do. So this is sexy to chicken, or sexy to dinosaur transition. So we started off as sexy, we had the label clamp saying it was sexy, and we flipped it to dinosaur. Here's again, I, I really need to change these demos because it's always sexy. I feel kind of weird saying it in front of all these people. Um, but this is sexy to normal. And then we're walking normally. You saw it speed up. And now we're going to switch the label back to sexy. Maybe I could just call it sultry. Um, and now you see it sort of walking and, 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 and stopping and posing in a sultry way. Um, this is doing some blending now. So we can turn one of these style variables on, influences the dynamic, and then not actually turn it off, but sort of blend in another style label. So you can start getting things like um, sexy and strong at the same time. This is kind of like a strong, sexy walk. <laughs> it's a little weird. Um, yeah, so it's kind of like a swagger. Um, anyways, so you can do uh, much more with this model. And this actually went to, uh, got picked up by, by a company that was interested in, in, in providing motion models to animators. Because you can imagine that if you're an animator and you have two options, you can either um, basically hand animate, obviously using tools like Maya and 3D Studio and so forth, or you can buy your own motion capture setup for $250,000. Um, but if you're like a freelance games animator, you don't have that kind of cash, and you also don't have a lot of time to do hand animation. So having a generative model that you can put in some parameters like I want you know, running, and I want it to be strong and, and fast, and, and so forth, you manipulate that, and then it just gives you a motion that you can import into your animation program that might be quite a useful tool for you. So, um, OK, so we can look at this motion. It, it looks nice, looks realistic. Um, and so that's kind of a qualitative evaluation. But how do we evaluate these methods quantitatively? Well, well typically, one thing we do is do predictive um, measurements. So we can't really compute likelihoods in these models. The same reason why we can't uh, compute likelihoods in RBM, we have this thing called the partition function. I haven't really talked about that today, but basically uh, makes it analytically uh, intractable to, to work out for, you know, other than really trivial small models. Um, there, there are these methods called annealed importance sampling that uh, people have used to estimate the partition functions and actually get likelihood estimates out. But that doesn't work in conditional models because anytime we condition on, say, the past or these style variables, that changes a partition function. So this is still an open problem. People haven't really figured out how to, how to do this. Um, but we can evaluate their predictive power. So even though it's been trained in a generative way, not, tr not you know, training, say, like an RNN to do predictions, um, we can hold out some data and have it predict forward at different steps. So you'll see an autoregressive model here in blue does extremely well at doing sort of one, two, or three step predictions. But then once it gets beyond that, it's, it's, it starts to fall off in terms of its performance. And we try various examples. The numbers here actually show the number of free parameters in the model. So we do find that introducing style variables, so incorporating label information um, into our predictor, and doing factoring to reduce the number of free parameters, um, 
actually helps us do well. So, um, you know, here lower is better because it's, it's prediction error. So um, we also try things like unfactored models, but again, I said it has lots of parameters, and you can see there that it does. Um, we only could use 100 hidden units instead of 600 uh, because of the parameter blow ups. We tried to keep for these models the parameters roughly in the same ballpark. Um, but anyways, you can also evaluate these models in terms of denoising motion as well, or denoising other types of time series. Okay, so I have about five minutes if I'm gonna take questions. I wanted to talk a little bit about activity recognition because I've worked in that area as well. Um, I was going to talk about someone else's work uh, using confnets for activity recognition because we've talked a little bit about 2D confnets, but we haven't talked about 3D confnets. So, you know, one way you could go about doing video analysis using confnets is to do it frame by frame, right? And just use a 2D convolutional net to analyze um, each frame treating them as still images. And Jan LeCun has done that a while ago. Um, but alternatively, you could do uh, 3D convolutions on your videos. And this will actually allow you to learn some discriminative features across time frames. Um, so basically what you have here, um, you know, we have a 2D convolution pictured here, but now you have uh, 3D convolutions where you're connecting to multiple frames. You have some uh, temporal extent that's fixed and that's replicated. Um, and in practice, actually, you don't have just like a single set of filters that look at different frames. You have multiple sets of filters, right? So you have something like this over here where, where colors are always indicating parameter tying. So you're going to do multiple convolutions um, on contiguous frames and extract multiple features, right? So you have multiple feature maps at each time frame. So um, some researchers, actually Kai Yu is going to be talking in this tutorial, was involved with this project doing um, a, a 3D ConvNet architecture for activity recognition. So here you have a hardwired first layer that extracts grayscale features, X and Y gradients, and X and Y optical flow. And that's fed into um, a bunch of different 3D filters uh, that are applied to each of these input blocks independently. As in a standard ConvNet, you just do subsampling, but now you're just doing it in a 3D instead of 2D sense. And then, as usual, you have some fully connected layers at the end, and then you get out, uh, you have basically a softmax unit at the top, which is predicting um, the activity. And so these, these guys applied it to uh, TrekVid surveillance data as well as KTH. And the thing I'll say, as in all ConvNets, I mean, there is some human, um, prior assumptions put into the, the net in terms of assuming the sort of pictorial or here temporal structure. Um, but there was some additional sort of vision engineering in terms of running person detectors ahead of time and doing foreground extraction and, and hard coding this first layer. So, um, you know, it's sort of a combination of hardwired and learned uh, way to do activity recognition. We've also looked at this problem using these three-way models. So basically, this is a form of that uh, three-way RBM I showed you doing the shifting pixels. But basically, the idea here is to apply it convolutionally. So you know we're no longer limited to modeling small image patches because we are doing this weight sharing. Um, so you remember these two views, basically this autoregressive model gated by the hiddens or the RBM that's gated by the input. Well, we're just going to do this in a convolutional setting. So instead of having all of the uh, pixels in a frame connected through um, a, a you know, full set of weights, we're going to have successive frames um, have uh, 2D uh, filters, you know, but they're going to be connected to both the input and the output. And these are going to create feature maps that are spatially organized, but represent the transformation between input and output. And this we use as sort of a first layer of unsupervised feature extraction um, as a preprocessor to a 3D convolutional net. Um, so remember those shifting pixel examples? This is just running that on sort of the NORB data set. Again, it's a synthetic data set, but you can see that, that it's able to do not just shifting pixels, but it can take, you know, learn transformations between these little objects, take a novel input, and then apply to it the same transformation it just observed, right? So it learns about transformations. And you can imagine that for doing activity recognition, learning about transformations is a good thing. If you look at some of the feature maps that we extract um, 
using the KTH data set. So each one of these rows is a different feature in the model. And you see some of them um, represent motion sensitive features. So number one, row one here and row three um, are very motion sensitive. You see on um, hand clapping here, they're, they're spatially uh, lo localized on the hands as a person claps their hands. And they're also directionally sensitive. So you see one on one hand, one on the other hand. Uh, the hands are actually moving um, in opposite directions. And um, you'll also get some static type features from this model too. So uh, edge features and one that just sort of learns to segment the person. So um, the fact that it can learn static and dynamic features is actually a good thing because you want to sometimes learn context when you're doing things like activity recognition. The idea here is that you want to say recognize driving it may be useful to recognize road scenes. Is there a question back there? Yeah. So um, for the dynamic features you get here, though, like hands clapping, right? Yep. These will be just hands clapping at a certain frequency. So do you have a way to deal with like dilations or contractions of that? No, so this this only looks at pairs of frames. So that frequency actually will be related to sort of the sampling rate of your video and that's and that's fixed. Um, so there's no sort of multi-scale uh, temporal thing going on here. But it's, it's certainly a good suggestion on how this model could be improved and expanded. So um, basically we've applied this to K KTH. This is uh, 2010, so it's a couple years ago. We've since been eclipsed by their methods and deep learning methods. Andrew talked about some of these methods. So we do reasonably well in KTH. Um, we also do reasonably well in a much uh, more challenging data set. But actually, Andrew Ng's group is getting at about 52% using um, their form of a temporal ICA. So um, that's basically it for the first part of the tutorial. I'm going to come back and talk to you a bit about similarity learning. Um, so we talked about learning distributed representations, why, those, why that's a good thing, how it compares to the so prior models like HMMs and LDS. Um, we extended RBMs to conditional RBMs. Uh, factored conditional RBMs to integrate context variables. And then we looked at very briefly a couple activity recognition methods. So um, hopefully come back. Um, a bunch of people have asked me why I moved to Belgium. Uh, so I'm not actually living in Belgium, Guelph's near Toronto. So okay, well enjoy your break. We'll, we'll talk to you after the break.